From MTN News, this is Face the State. Welcome back to Face the State. I'm Augusta McDonald. And I'm Jackie Coffin. Augusta, we say at every show, it was a busy week in the Capitol. This is a busy sh session. Lawmakers only have 90 working days to get their work done. Yes, Jackie, that's right. But this week stands out. Lawmakers are trying to push all the legislation through that they can. The transmittal deadline was Friday. Bills that change state law but don't appropriate money or increase or decrease state revenue die Friday if they can't pass through either the House or the Senate. Majority Republicans are fast tracking several pieces of legislation trying to clear that deadline but democrats say the rush to push bills through hinders public participation less of an opportunity to weigh in they get less of an opportunity to show up and say their piece and it's a lot harder um, to follow legislation that might have an impact on their lives um, or their communities after the transmittal deadline the legislature is expected to take a break they'll return thursday of next week with about two more months to go in the session and the rush of bills means early mornings and late nights, and our reporters were there to follow what's moving through. Jonathan and Barian and Sam Hoyle camping out at the Capitol, and they break down the action on Wednesday. Montana representatives spent about nine hours on the House floor Wednesday as they debated and took preliminary votes on about 90 bills, each of which has to meet a Friday transmittal deadline to get through the first chamber or die in the process. The House is planning to get through nearly 200 bills by the end of the week. On Wednesday, members gave initial approval to two different proposals for charter schools. The first, House Bill 562, would create community choice schools and establish a state commission to authorize charter proposals. The second, House Bill 549, would give local school districts the first opportunity to set up charter schools. Lawmakers disagreed over which proposal would be best, but many voted to keep both moving forward. If you're motivated to get a charter school, uh, a functional charter school uh, program in front of this state, I would recommend that we advance both of these and work and work through reconciling them so that, that we can have a win for the students and parents of Montana that's satisfactory for everyone. The House also endorsed HB 575, which would prohibit abortion of viable infants except when necessary to protect the mother's life. It would require providers to make a determination of viability in writing, and it would presume viability no later than 24 weeks into pregnancy. Some of the other bills the House endorsed Wednesday afternoon include an expansion of the Coal Trust Homes Program to support multifamily housing, a ban on ranked choice voting in state or local elections, and a bill establishing state rules seeking to prevent large tech companies from censoring based on viewpoint. It was a very busy Wednesday on the Senate floor as many bills were heard and either passed or failed as we head towards the 68th legislative session's transmittal deadline on Friday. Several housing bills passed second readings, but one exceptionally interesting bill to the general public would be Senate Bill 323, brought by Republican Senator Jeremy Trebus of Great Falls, which would allow duplex, triplex, and fourplex homes to be built on land zoned for single family homes. That bill passed 48, 42 to 8 rather. Uh, Senate Bill 328 by Senator Dennis Lenz from Billings, which passed its second reading unanimously, has the potential to integrate policies from the Indian Child Care Welfare Act that the United States Congress passed in the 1970s into all child protection services cases in Montana, that assuming the bill moves through the House. And two bills that caught fire over the last few months following the suspected Chinese surveillance balloon earlier this year. Senate Bill 206, brought by Kenneth Bogner, would prevent quote-unquote foreign adversaries from buying, leasing, or renting land used for agricultural production or real property or residence that has a direct line of sight to any part of a military installation. That bill passed 48 to 2, but a similar bill, Senate Bill 256, brought by Carl Glim from Kyla, which states that any resident from a country deemed as a foreign adversary by the U.S. government must sell their property before the end of the year or face the imminent domain process. That bill was not endorsed by the Senate. Thursday was packed as well. Our reporters were there, and here's the wrap. It took from 8 a.m. until after 8 p.m., but the Montana Senate got through debate on 70 bills Thursday, wrapping up their work for the first half of the 68th legislative session. 49 senators having voted aye, one having voted no. The committee, the whole report has been adopted. 
After a full day of debates and preliminary votes, the Senate suspended their rules and held final votes on all the bills they advanced, finishing a full day before the transmittal deadline. During their afternoon and evening session, the Senate voted down a proposal to prevent cities and counties from banning short-term rentals, but they did give preliminary approval to a bill that would confirm those rentals as a residential use for zoning purposes and limit how local governments can restrict them. Senators also endorsed a bill that would ban the app TikTok within the state, citing its ownership by a Chinese company and claims that it collected significant data on its users against their will. The company released a response saying those were deeply flawed arguments and calling the bill, quote, an egregious violation of Montanans' free speech rights that will close off Montana from the 100 million strong TikTok community in the United States. In a long day for the House of Representatives, debates grew longer as lawmakers work to finish up as much as they can ahead of the halfway point. Earlier in the day, House Bill 676 from Representative Carrie Seekins Crow regarding parental rights did pass its second reading on Thursday morning, 67 to 33, after a lengthy and at points emotional debate. The bill's premise is that parents have fundamental rights when it comes to raising, educating, and caring for the physical and mental health of their child, and narrowly tailors when the government can involve itself in those decisions. Another bill from earlier was House Bill 774 from Representative Mike Hopkins of Missoula. That bill lays out a plan to move all elections to even years and be held either on the day of primary or general elections. Hopkins noted that the bill itself is not final and that a similar one is in the Senate and passed second reading. Representatives from smaller counties stood mostly in opposition of the bill, though despite that it did pass 62 to 38 on the promise from Representative Hopkins that the bill would return from the Senate looking different in its entirety. One controversial bill that appears to have died is House Bill 604 from Jennifer Carlson of Gallatin County. The bill would have created what is known as the Sheriff's First Law, where federal employees that are planning on making an arrest, search, or seizure must obtain permission from the sheriff in the county that they wish to do so and rejects federal laws that allow federal employees to supersede the duties of county sheriffs. Many express concern over the bill's constitutionality. It failed to pass on second reading by a vote of 32 to 68. And lastly, one of the abortion bills debated on Thursday was House Bill 786 from Representative Lola Sheldon Galloway of Great Falls. The bill requires medical providers to report any adverse effects a person has following taking a medication to perform an abortion and penalties for failing to report. That bill did make it through to a third reading, 65 to 35. Making it ahead of the transmittal deadlines are some controversial bills, including two bills to de designed to tighten regulations on abortion in Montana, which is drawing emotional testimony from lawmakers on both sides of the debate. Monday, the House Judiciary Committee held a hearing on legislation prohibiting so-called dismemberment abortions. Supporters say the bill is not a full abortion ban. It only blocks one procedure. But opponents argue the words dismemberment abortions are inflammatory and that the, bill tar the ban targets the safest and most common form of abortion. This bill would allow politicians to stand in the way of a person's decision and a doctor's recommendation. A person's health, not politics, should guide important medical decisions during pregnancy. This does not stop a woman from obtaining an abortion. As I just stated, there are multiple ways still available. Please don't be distracted by any of the opposition's what if or people's unadjudicated opinions as the one stated here in the legal note. Also under consideration in the House, a bill that would require health care providers to perform life-saving care on infants born alive, including after an abortion. Op opponents of this say it's unnecessary and already part of law. Thanks, Jackie. And beating the transmittal deadline and making its way through the state Senate now is a bill prohibiting children from attending drag shows. House Bill 359 passed through the House last week. All but one Republican representative voted for the bill. All the Democrats were against it. The legislation would prohibit a business from admitting anybody under the age of 18 while hosting drag performances and ban drag shows on public property that would affect events like pride and coming up governor greg gianforte makes the case for disaster resiliency funding while senator steve daines tries to ban brazilian beef and right after the break i take a closer look at bills targeting some specific types of housing as face the state continues welcome back to face the state 
Welcome back to Face the State. Passing from the House to the Senate with almost unanimous support is a bill out of billings. Adding accountability to pandemic era housing funds as they're set to expire. House Bill 523 would require the Department of Commerce to disclose what businesses, property management companies, and landlords received funding from the Montana Emergency Rental Assistance Program, which allocated more than $100 million of federal funding given to the state through the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. The bill brought by Representative Mike Yakowich, a Republican from Billings, passed the House earlier this week. I wish to just say that this bill is to look at the funding, who benefited from it, who received it, and that they agreed, it, uh, as the fund ends, that they will give us a financial report. The hearings for House Bill 523 were short and sweet, but the problem it addresses is huge. So big that some city leaders in Billings say it's the largest crisis the city will face this year. The Econo Lodge is one of the motels that accepts Mira funding, and for many months it was at the rate of $2,200 a month. On one of the coldest days of winter, Mervyn Lewis is leaving the place he's called home. You got to do your own, your own cleaning and all that. You know, they're not too punctual on housekeeping for bedding and towels. Lewis has been living at the Econo Lodge in Billings. He normally works as a commercial truck driver, but medical problems put him out of work. I've been here for about a month, over a month and a half. It's not up to par on what I'm expecting for a room. Paying for long stay housing at the Econo Lodge was possible. Thanks to funds from the Montana Emergency Rental Assistance Program, or MIRA, which pays hotels to house people three months at a time. So essentially what they did is they said, if you cannot find housing because there's no housing available, if you've exhausted all of your housing options, we will allow you to stay in a motel. People got wind of that. The pool of emergency housing money comes from the American Rescue Plan, a stimulus bill passed by Congress during COVID-19. Montana received $183 million, which was given to the Montana Department of Commerce to distribute. And that's where the problem began. And they didn't spend it fast enough initially. So the federal government took some of that funding back and told them you need to spend the rest of this or we're going to take it back also. And things snowballed from there. To spend the money, the agency began providing the funds to hotels willing to house people for up to 18 months without many parameters. And some hotels began to misuse the money. So you're talking about $6,600 for a three-month period. And sometimes folks wouldn't stay in the motels for the three months. Sometimes it would be because the motel might kick them out early. Sometimes it might be that they leave. Uh, but those motels were required to give that money back to the state to be dispersed back out to others who needed it. And that did not happen. Now, funds have been cut off and the program is set to end in late March. That means an estimated 1,600 people currently in Billings hotels could be without a place to stay. People like Mervyn Lewis. People need a place to live. But that place may be hard to find. But there's no silver bullet here. A blow to some mobile home park residents after a pair of bills expanding their rights and park decisions fail in front of Montana lawmakers. For one mobile home park, it is the latest in a series of challenges ranging from black water to rate hikes. When you turn on the taps, Ron and Carla McCracken's water now runs clear. Smells like chlorine. But still, they won't drink it. Will you guys drink the water here? Nope. No. Water has been an issue for tenants at the Meadowlark Mobile Home Park for years. Frequent outages, discoloration, and sediment has oh, turned a lot of residents to bottled water. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty dirty. And Carla McCracken worries the water made her sick over the holidays. Over Thanksgiving, I got an um, E. coli infection in my kidney. And do you think that's from the water? Yes. The Utah-based owners of Meadowlark Haven Park have been working to fix the water problem, blaming outdated well systems. The company provided a statement to MTN this week that the water issues were completely resolved six to seven weeks ago. But these photos show water from the tap of one park resident just this week, and residents say they are still under a boil order. The water problems get a lot of attention, but simmering beneath is anger over rent hikes. January 1st by $41. 
Residents say rates have been increased six times in the almost three years since Haven Park purchased the park. Cherry Creek out here, I think they've complained about it. And that's the same company. And they hoped lawmakers could fix the issue. Two bills introduced to the legislature this session would have prevented rate hikes like the ones at Meadowlark by offering residents leases. That's House Bill 428 carried by Representative Mike Yakowich of Billings. How can we work with trailer court um, uh, clients, people who have those trailers, and give them, let's say, a one-year lease? Its companion bill, House Bill 429, carried by Representative George Nicolakakos of Great Falls, would have given mobile home park tenants first dibs in buying parks when they come up for sale. If property taxpayers had faced the kinds of winds that mobile home residents have faced over the last few years, people would be throwing tea into the harbors right now. But landlords and mobile home park owners showed up in droves to oppose the bills. The Montana Landlord Association is against this bill, and this bill will actually do more harm than good. Government has no right to limit the private sale of private property. I question whether or not the tenants are the best option available. And both bills were tabled by the committee. With the legislature moving on and a bad taste left after years of water problems and rate hikes, residents at Meadowlark don't know what comes next. We've lived here for 30 years. We're retired now and this was our plan to yeah. have our space to retire in. We shouldn't have to move because of them. Nope. Another bill up for consideration would place new regulations on sober living homes. If it passes, owners of these facilities would need a national certification before receiving any state funding. There are 40 sober living homes in Billings. Owners say they worry the legislation will add unneeded government oversight to a program helping dozens of people recovering from substance abuse disorders. There are a lot of really good sober livings out there that don't necessarily are affiliated with a national organization, but then there are unfortunately ones that are not affiliated with any and also, you know, probably have some work to do. I feel that anytime you have something good like that and it is running well and then government gets into it, you have a huge chance of ruining the whole thing. The legislation would also address safety protocols inside these homes, including rules regarding personal belongings and keeping opioid overdose medication on site. Stick with Face the State. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the State. Welcome back to Face the State. A man accused of threatening to kill Montana U.S. Senator John Tester has been denied release from jail. During a detention hearing, Magistrate Judge Kathleen DeSoto denied Kevin Patrick Smith's release, citing community safety. DeSoto said there is clear and convincing evidence establishing that no condition or combination of conditions will reasonably assure the safety of the community if Smith were released. Smith has been remanded to the custody of the United States Marshal pending further proceedings. He's accused of leaving several threatening messages on Senator John Tester's voicemail at his Kalispell office, including several coming after the FBI warned him to stop. Foreign entities continue to make their presence known in the United States agriculture food market. Brazilian beef exports to China were halted after a case of mad cow disease was confirmed in Brazil's northern state of Para. Concern of the South American beef giant reporting cases of BSE has prompted legislators to re-implement a bill that would halt Brazil's imports. Ryan Gamboa spoke with producers and industry leaders on how these findings affect Montana's cattle industry. In January of 2022, according to the USDA, Brazilian imports of beef were up 500 percent. That's 100 million pounds of beef. Is we need to keep looking at what the Brazilians are doing and making sure that they're playing by the rules like everyone else is. That's John Grandy, president of the Montana Stock Growers Association. On Thursday, BSC, better known as Mad Cow Disease, was confirmed in Brazil. Because they've had cases reported in Brazil, that does not mean that our beef supply is in any way unsafe. You know, the United States has some of the strictest, most careful standards for safe beef in the world. And, and anything that we know of this situation at this point doesn't change that. Despite the United States regulations on foreign beef, United States Senators John Tester and Mike Rounds reintroduced a bipartisan legislation to ban Brazilian beef imports. Senator Tester shared in a statement, in quote, as a third generation farmer, I have repeatedly demanded that America stop accepting beef from Brazil. Our ranchers here in Montana raise the best beef and consumers can trust that it is safe. 
He went on to add that to block Brazilian beef imports until they can prove that their products meet our health and safety standards. While this isolated incident may not be a huge deal, whether they are following the rules and being a responsible player, that is a big deal because it could it could be very huge if one of these other things like foot and mouth were to crop up. Jan McDonald is a member of the Montana Cattlemen's Association and producer, and she says that the problem goes further. To educate the consumer as to the situation. If you're walking down the street and just talk to anybody and say, do you know what you buy when you go to the grocery store? And they'll say they haven't got a clue. You go to the restaurant and you ask them where their beef's from. They can't tell you. And we feel that people have the right to know. Jan and her husband run 1,200 acres of pasture land near Fairfield. In her eyes, Brazil is a threat to the entire cattle industry. And it's a proven fact that I don't know that there's another country that produces the quality of beef that the United States does. There's the, the future of agriculture is not, not real promising. Currently, no cases of BSE have been reported in the United States. Delaying reporting of cases is a cover of lenient food safety procedures, raising concerns of foot and mouth disease, African swine fever, and RCAF USA. In Great Falls, Ryan Gamboa, MTN News. Montana Governor Greg Gianforte unveiled an ambitious plan this week to fix a canal that's caused all kinds of damage to homes here in the Magic City. But the plan isn't cheap. It would cost an estimated $25 million. But if the governor gets his way, this project and several others in Montana would be paid for through a new $100 million disaster resiliency fund. Alina Howder has a closer look at this proposal. This 120-year-old irrigation ditch known as the Billings Canal has a history of seepage and it's caused tons of damage for families living below. Some even fear that bigger problems could be coming if issues with this ditch aren't addressed now. These images from 2019 show cracked foundations and bowing walls. The aftermath of groundwater that seeped out of the Billings Canal into this house that sits right below the ditch. As the city grew up into our ditch, Unfortunately, there weren't any precautions taken for any of these disasters. That house is now one of several abandoned homes I discovered when I ventured into the neighborhood on Viewcrest Street, all left vacant because of those problems with the ditch, especially since the slope behind it is moving. The fact that the hill is sliding makes this canal even unstable. I understood from KC that we think that the, the, the ditch itself is moving down. Hill. And if the ditch was full of water, the impact could be catastrophic. That's roughly 260 million gallons of water that would be dumped into the neighborhood below, which puts us at, at significant risk of loss of life. That's why Governor Gianforte was in Billings Wednesday, hoping to urge the legislature to move forward with his proposal to establish a $100 million local disaster resiliency fund using budget surplus money to prevent emergencies. And here's the best part. For every dollar the state puts in, the federals give it the the federal authorities give us match it with nine additional dollars. This slope failure project would cost an estimated $25 million, but several others across the state have also been identified. Everything from improving a levee in Glasgow to a power line project in the Flathead. Back here in Billings, this ditch is being closely monitored with sensors. Hopefully that will give us a, a heads up. Um, early enough to do something if we had a catastrophic failure, but we would know about it sooner at least. But a long-term solution is needed. Seven of these homeowners sued the Billings Benchwater Association, asking the association to take responsibility, saying their homes are no longer livable. I really hope this legislation goes through because it can provide the match fundings that we need to do a big project. In Billings, Alina Howder, MTN News. Thank you, Alina. We're back after the break to take a look at the week ahead as Face the State continues. Welcome back to Face the State. Welcome back. And joining us now, MTN senior political reporter, Jonathan Ambarian, with a look at what we can expect this week. Jonathan, what did this transmittal week look like? You guys spent a lot of time at the Capitol. Well, yeah, I mean, it was a busy, busy, busy week at the Capitol transmittal deadline when all these bills have to get across uh, their first chamber or they die. So we heard, you know, some probably o over a couple hundred of them between the House and Senate. Uh, I was in there. Uh, and Sam Hoyle from our station here in Helena was up up there, uh, you know, 10, 12 hours uh, on the floor. So, yeah, it's it's a lot of, a lot going on. But the chambers are on break now. They're going to be out 
all almost all of next week, the Senate is going to come back for just a what they call a pro forma session, a very short session with no real business on Thursday. And so it won't be until Friday that any uh, real work starts up here again. And um, so, so just explain for anybody who doesn't fully understand what a transmittal deadline is, what does this uh, date mean in terms of the legislature? Well, it, first of all, it's the halfway point. It, we're 45 days into what is the 90-day session that we do every two years. And the transmittal is just, a, it's a deadline. And a, any bill that doesn't appropriate money or raise or lower state revenue, uh, in order to keep things moving, they want all those bills if a bill doesn't pass through either the House or Senate by the transmittal date, the 45th day, then it dies. It won't be able to move forward. And so what we saw here was just a winnowing of all the proposals that came in and now only a few, I shouldn't say a few of them, still hundreds of them are still going forward into the other house, but it, it narrows down a lot. Uh, there are gonna be a lot fewer bills going forward, but of course they're gonna be uh, bigger bills. We're going to be talking a lot about budget and thing like that in the second half. So it's a different um, it's a different feel. The transmittal point is is the halfway point, and it's definitely sort of a transition point in how the legislature is working. And so, talk a little bit about what you saw this week. Um, uh, there were some some hefty floor hearings. Um, a lot of bills got pushed through, and there's also some uh, concerns that this uh, kind of expediated uh, time frame, because they're trying to get so much work done by a drop dead deadline, can inhibit uh, kind of the public's access to the information and even the lawmakers' abilities to review the information themselves. What were you hearing about those? Kind of general yeah, concerns. the um, the Democratic uh, minority up here is is not thrilled with how things ran the last couple of weeks. They just feel like a lot of these bills they had to shorten the hearings um, in order to get all the bills through, and so they feel like maybe the public didn't have as much input on some of these as as they wanted to. I think you know one thing to to note is that everything's going to have a second hearing. Everything comes around twice in the legislature, so. There will be hearings on the other side in whatever whatever chamber they go to next. But uh, yeah, certainly uh, uh, it was something that we heard, uh, as I say, the minority party was not really happy about. The majority is, is saying, well, these are the bills that come in and every bill has to have a hearing. That's in the rules. And so if, if we're going to give them all a hearing, then we have to do what we can. And so uh, the Republican leadership has said, uh, yeah, they're, they're trying trying their best. Everybody's trying their best. They started uh, sort of these rush, uh, I shouldn't say rush, but the sort of expediting processes earlier in the years than, than I remember them doing it in the past. I mean, they were starting last week to try and move things through. So, yeah. Okay. And so um, lawmakers are back in session next Thursday, correct? Yes. Uh, well, as I say, yeah, so not a lot of work going to be done on Thursday, but uh, yeah, that's the next legislative day. And then, uh, yeah, we're about two months from two months from wrapping up the session. So. All right. Two months to go. Again, our uh, senior political reporter, Jonathan, thank you. Thank you.